Okay. So, when we have ended last episode, the party had just gotten to the entrance as to where they think the uh, the path that leads towards Kragma Hideout is. But they hadn't started searching yet. And there are a couple of ways that this can be done. A single player can begin the process of searching on their own. A single player can be assisted by another player. And if they do that, they gain advantage on that particular uh, in investigation or perception check. All of the parties can be independently looking for the actual entrance or path that leads towards Kragma Hideout, but none of them would gain advantage in any way, shape, or form. And so the, it really comes down to the players how they want to do that. You as a DM should remind them of that particular aspect of it, because if you're playing an early game, chances are they're not going to know those rules. Um, and for simplicity's sake, you as the DM have some options. You can have them individually roll if they decide to go that route, or if you look on the DM side, you can have them run or you can actually roll the investigation check for them the other option would be to have them individually roll their own perception or investigation uh, checks none of which appear to be uh, proficient in investigation at the moment um, and then they would just simply click on the little die that's here on this particular part of the uh, the skills tab um, for simplicity's sake, I'm going to run an investigation skill check from the party sheet on the DM side. And that's primary because the entire party has said that they're going to uh, do, do the checks individually. So I'm going to roll that. And right away, we see that Clever, Fairfarn have rolled high enough that I would consider that they successfully found the path. Okay. So now that the players have found the trail, I want to point out that the details for that particular trail are not on the Kragma Hideout page. They're actually a page prior. And if you scroll down, you will see the title Goblin Trail here. And there are a couple of things the players can do. In this case, the players aren't going to do them. Um, but they could study the trail and to determine uh, roughly how many uh, goblins have passed through here. Um, that will show them that this confirms that the goblins are using this particular trail uh, to get to Kragma Hideout, because for all they know, the trail that they have found could just simply be a random trail. It might not even be the trail that they're looking for. Uh, in addition to that, and this is something the players don't know, is that there are traps that are staged along the actual uh, the trail. And you can see here that they will travel approximately 10 minutes down the path before they start entering an area where there are snare traps. Um, if players are not actively looking for uh, those particular uh, traps or whatnot, then they're not making active checks. Uh, however, um, there is a, percep a passive perception check that can uh, come into play here. Um, but they still have to be looking for it, according to the description. Character searching for traps, characters who lead spot that, but that. All right. So, in this case, um, Clever, being our rogue, is going to be keeping an eye open uh, for traps, as will Grow, who happens to be the most perceptive, perceptive person in the party. Um, his passive perception, if I go to the character sheet here, is a 14. That does, in fact, exceed the passive wisdom check um, that would allow them to actually spot uh, the particular trap. So in this particular case, they're going to successfully determine, oh, oop, there's a trap there. We can go around. Um, if they do happen to fall in, there's a chance that it could take some damage. Um, they have it quite heavily camouflaged as well. So this particular trap is an additional 10 minutes down. And once again, his passive perception is uh, high, but it is not high enough to observe this one. So he's not going to necessarily see this. But because he has stated that he's actively searching for that, he is going to roll a perception check. Or, a better yet, I could have the perception check rolled on his behalf. So I select grow 
go to skills, and then I roll a perception check again. Oops, I don't know why it's centering like that. And I double click. You'll see that on the player side, they don't know what you rolled. But on the DM side, they have in fact managed to successfully detect that particular trap. So they managed to avoid that, and therefore they managed to avoid uh, 1d6 bludgeoning damage. Now, as a DM, you could potentially describe this trail along these lines. What you see before you is a very heavily overgrown uh, trail um, that has a worn area uh, along the ground and appears to have uh, had a lot of traffic pass through it over the last uh, short period of time. Um, the canopy of the, the bushes around you is, is covering and encroaching over uh, the overall uh, path itself. And as you pr continue to progress, um, Gro realizes that they're going through a particular area that could be... That, that he, he gets a sense that there's something there. Um, and surely enough, he, he was able to successfully spot the snare trap. With that, he was able to lead the party around that particular uh, segment of where the trap and essentially what they saw were leaves strewn about um, in a circular pattern that seemed to be out of place. And uh, when he shifted the actual leaves aside, he realized that there was a vine or a rope that was on the ground. And after following the trail as to where that led, it gave him the indication that there was a snare trap there. Once past that particular spot, um, Gro continued to actively search for um, further traps, now knowing that there were definitely traps along the trail. And after coming to an additional area that appears to have been cleared out a little bit more, uh, he realized that there was a, a camouflage pit trap here. And he kicked aside the camouflage and discovered that there were uh, several spikes down at the bottom and, and whatnot. And uh, while the trap itself isn't overly uh, deep or steep, um, it would have potentially hurt one of the party members. Once again, he successfully manages to, to lead the party around that particular uh, risk, uh, trap. An additional 20 minutes down the, down the path, no further traps were discovered. The party eventually comes along and discovers uh, a cave. And I'm going to set that up now. Okay. So at this point, you will notice that I have not shared this particular map out to the players yet. And that is what the, re, uh, the reason why I haven't done that yet, is I want to enable line of sight. And you do that by clicking on this little eyeball right here. That's automatically going to throw on the mask. And that's automatically going to cover these areas that are uh, are uh, invisible. Now, these areas here, you can't see through, and that would make sense for these particular things. Um, whereas other aspects of this particular path, except for this area here, would be visible. So you'll see these areas when you move your, your mouse over, where this you can see, but it's going to be blocked. You have to be inside of this particular area to be able to reveal anything that's up in this area or vice versa. OK? So now that I have that enabled, I'm just going to lock that again. I'm now going to share the map over to the players. So the players are now going to see a black screen. And now I am going to drag the party onto the map. So I'll just center that. Oh, I don't want to do that. There used to be a way to just grab them and drop them into place. But you see, it's going to remove that particular character from that. So what I'm going to do, is there a... No, there is not. Okay, so I'm just going to do it the other way. The other way right now is going to make use of the combat tracker. If I were to take a portrait and drop that onto the map, you'll notice that it doesn't work. And I ran into that when I first 
dropped a, a player member onto the party. And you see that that's not working. The reason for that is you actually have to drop the token. Now, if I try to take the token from here, you'll also notice that you can't drop the token into place. It doesn't come directly from the character sheet. It comes from the combat tracker. And as you can see, now that I am placing the party members on the map, all of the party members are now exposing this particular aspect and area of the map. And you'll see here that you can see into the bush, but you can't see past the bush. So that's what uh, the terrain uh, indication does here. And I'm not sure why um, the decision was made to expose the, uh, the key, but yeah, whatever. It doesn't seem to be an issue. Now I'm going to zoom in, and what I'm going to do is sync. Oops, I'm not stop sharing. Um, there used to be an option to sync, so apparently it does, that doesn't appear to be the case. Um, ah, sync the client view. All right. So sync the client view used to be under uh, a sub menu on the classic edition. So if you are looking for syncing of the view, you actually now have to go to view. And it is this indicate this icon right here. Okay. So any existing uh, DM, that's where you'll now want to look. All right. Now, as a DM, the one of the things that I find very difficult to control is how do you deal with movement in reference to party members moving. In some cases, um, party members can move simultaneously, and they can do so by on the player side, clicking on their icon and moving about with the arrow keys. Now I'm using the arrow keys that are between on a, a full keyboard that are between the number pad and the main portion of the keyboard and below the insert home, pause, delete, end, uh, sorry, page up, page down uh, sections. And that is the area where I'm moving it. I am also pushing the keys on the key uh, number keypad. With numlock on, they don't move. With numlock off, they move. So if you have a player that needs to move around um, and they only have a, the, a number pad type of key uh, keyboard, then they have to have numlock off in order to actually move around. Okay? So just keep that in mind. Now you'll see, as I was doing that, that various aspects of the map are now being exposed. However, there are also areas of the map that are being reshaded. So on the player screen, if you look here, you'll observe um, that this particular aspect of the map has been reshaded. It's not fully dark like it is with the rest of the map here. And this area here is still exposed because it has been made visible at some point when I went and moved back, of, back and forth. So what you get is two states of fog of war. You get a full blackout coverage, which is where the, the solid black color is. But at the same time, you get a visibility fog that just reshades those areas with a slightly darker or a slightly lighter shade of gray um, to indicate that you can no longer see that particular area of the map. And what that means is that as the DM, I should theoretically be able to see the visibility um, which I can't at the moment, apparently. That might be a problem, because now as a DM, I'm not going to necessarily know what is being exposed by the player. Uh, I don't need to turn something on, do I? No, I don't believe so. Yep, so you can toggle the visibility, but that's about it. Use walls and lock. All right, so let's see. Yeah, so that still isn't going to expose to the DM what's actually there. Okay, um, that could pose a small problem, but I suppose you could surmise that if the players move into this area, they can see what's actually here. Okay, so I'm just going to relock that, resync the uh, client view here, and you'll see when I did that that it kept the zoom uh, level and center of focus at the same uh, same location. 
So as I was saying, from a DM's perspective, I find it very difficult to control a certain level of movement. So as a result of that, what I tend to do is enforce a movement initiative. So the initiative itself doesn't come into play with combat. It does come into play with, I'm going to move this map up a little bit so that it's out of the way. And I'm just going to um, minimize this one. Where did they put that now? Okay, we'll just reopen it when I need it. All right, and the reason I'm doing that is just so I can get a little bit more uh, visibility on the combat tracker here. So I'm going to move that up and bring this down a little bit. All right, so what I do is I enforce an initiative roll. I don't believe I can do an initiative roll here. So I'm going to get each of the players to do it individually. Oh, no, I know how I can do it. <laughs> Duh. So I'm going to have, uh, well, they're the only ones there. Now, what I'd use uh, the initiative for in this particular case is to control who gets to move. Um, now, theoretically, on a map like this, now that line of sight capability is in place, you could allow simultaneous movement. It's technically free movement in the sense that there's no combat situation occurring. Um, the party is kind of still looking around a little bit, so you can imagine that people would be moving around about an area, searching it, and, and stuff like that. And visibility on something could potentially trigger um, combat at some point. Now, I am going to do something in advance. Oops, one second. Cave mouth is that. Uh... Yeah, okay. So the cave mouth is the first thing that the players are going to see. So you're going to want to read or post to that, rather, so that they can now see the details of what they're actually visibly seeing. Now, that could potentially lead to the goblin blind. So I'm going to preload that encounter just as a precaution. Now, you'll notice that on the combat tracker on the player side, the players can't see that I've already loaded up to goblins the other area of risk are is this area up here and there are two potential encounters in this particular location so i'm going to preload those as well all right so the fisher is there the wolves are there and these are there the players are going to see this or they're going to be spotted by the goblins one of the other but if a player party decides to beeline it right in through to the center of the cave they're going to also run into these wolves now the advantage here is that you can expose only those uh npcs or in this case the goblins or the wolves that need to be exposed at a particular point in time so when the players move in a way that they actually spot that particular uh group at that point, you could have everybody roll an initiative roll, including the wolves, even though they're not actually going to get involved unless a party member like backs up to here to be able to shoot long range. Then all of a sudden they're now spotted by the wolves or they're going to spot the wolves. Then they become part of the uh, part of the combat. OK, so Farron Farron is going to go first. So I'm going to put the token on top of Fair Farron. Now, he's back, oops, yeah, he's right here. So this is Farm Farm. His movement is a grand total of 30 feet. Every one of these is five feet. So he could theoretically move six, yeah, six squares. So Farm Farm is not gonna be necessarily be quiet. So he's just gonna go to there. So I'm gonna have him move one. And yes, you can move diagonally. Which is why it makes sense to use the number pad, because you can move diagonally directly rather than doing something like this. All right, so he's going to go to there. That's 5, 10, 15, and 20. Now, all of a sudden, the goblin should be able to spot him, but he's not visible. And the reason for that is not... It's because I haven't set up the visibility rules on the NPCs. 
So visibility, include party vision. Okay, so including party vision. I'm going to move Fair Farm back here. Now you can see, ah, okay, so they've moved that ability into there. So you now have to turn on player party vision. And what that will do is that will expose what uh, what is actually going to happen. Okay, so it's going to be under visibility. You can reset fog of war, remove party vision, set to always invisible, or make sensitive visibility. Now I suspect make sensitive visibility is going to be what will make that particular uh, NPC show up. So as Fairfarn moves up, boom. Looking around, he now sees that there is a goblin there. He has initiative. He has not moved far enough out of reach. So he's moved one, two, three, four. He still has two movement squares. So theoretically, he could move down to here. And in fact, he's going to do just that. So one, he's going to keep deselecting. One, oh, second. Um, second, uh, Goblin is now exposed. Two. So he's going to move to there. And he's going to he's going to use his breath weapon. He's going to aim it in this direction. And the reason why I wanted to use the breath weapon in this case is to show you um, how an area of effect spell actually works on the map. Um, maybe I want to save that for the wolves, but that that would be the DM <laughs> thinking ahead, not the player. So he thinks right now he's got a risk here. So he's going to control. And you'll see in the combat tracker, I now have Goblin 8 and Goblin 9 targeted. So I hold I held down the control key and left clicked on both of these. And you'll see that their health icon is good. Hovering over them, you see their name. So that's some of the hovering um, capabilities I explained earlier in the series. And otherwise, you don't see any detail about that particular goblin. You have to hover over them. Okay, now, really? They're 10 feet. Okay, so every square here is 10 feet in this particular case. Interesting. All right, so for his action, he is going to attack with his breath weapon. Both of those goblins failed. Which means that when I roll the fire damage, they're both going to take damage. I was kind of hoping one had succeeded so that you could see how the half damage comes into play but here's the thing i've now used that breath weapon i can't use that again until that particular character has completed a rest however this damage resistance is always there so i'm going to make sure that that is active and he's resistant to fire and what you'll see here in the combat tracker you'll see an effect so that any time somebody attacks him with a fire-based weapon he will resist the damage that he's going to receive by uh, by fire. Now, he also has second wind, which means he could heal himself, but he's not going to worry about that just yet. He's essentially done his turn. And he's going to scream at the goblins going, Die, you foul creatures! I don't know. I don't know how a Dragonborn actually talks, but as a player, that's where you're going to develop how you want to actually play that particular character. Now, I'm done uh, as Farron Farn. I'm going to pass the token. So your turn is now complete. And a DM is always going to ask you, are you finished? And if you are, that implies that they're asking you to click the turn complete option. And what that's going to do is move uh, the turn to the next creature who is active. And it will also recenter the map. So I don't know if you guys saw that. Um, now, Goblin 8 is this guy. He just got spit at with a breath of fire from Farron So I'm going to... Oops, apparently I still have Farron selected here, so I'm going to deselect him. I'm going to select that particular goblin, and then I'm going to control left click to target Farron And you'll see on the DM screen that Farron is in fact targeted. Now, there are a couple of attacks that we have here. He has a short bow, but 
Chorpo's going to suffer uh, a, a bit of a penalty here, technically. Um, oops. Oh yeah, if you move the, <laughs> the scroll wheel <laughs> on a particular icon, it will allow you to change the direction that they are in fact facing. So it's a good way to tell the DM what direction you're facing. So if you want to zoom in further, just make sure you're not hovering over an icon when you do that. So did they change the scale in this particular map to 10 feet? No, one square is supposed to be five feet, so I don't know why it thinks it's 10 feet here. Um, so I might have to actually, and you'll see, actually, pointing that out, uh, you'll see that there's a resist fire effect that's now in place on Farm Farm when I actually apply that uh, that resistance. That, by the way, as long as you don't remove Farm Farm from the combat tracker, will always be there unless you intentionally remove the effect. And you can do that by clicking on... I have no idea what this icon is supposed to represent, but if you highlight over it, it's going to be an effect, and if you click to remove it, it will remove that resistance uh, from it. Okay, so because the scale on the map says 5 feet, I'm going to ignore the fact that there's 10 feet here and make an attack as normal. So I'm going to indicate that to... Um, I'm going to check to see if that's actually a bug, so let me get a screenshot of uh, of this. And yes, I'm going to do this right on uh, right on the stream. And I'm just going to save that or minimize that for now. Okay. All right. So this goblin is going to make a melee attack with his scimitar. And you do that by double clicking on this highlighted area. In this particular case, this goblin has missed. Now, curious as to what this nimble escape means. So he can take a disengage motion, or action rather, and it's a bonus action. He could theoretically try to escape and get to an area inside of the cave. That is one actual um, thing that could potentially happen. And I got to back up to to here. So the the um, campaign is going to tell you, the DM, how you should actually go through and play these goblins. And something in here... Okay, so these goblins apparently don't quote-unquote run if they're uh, under attack. All right, but you as the DM could theoretically make that goblin run and go up there. But this guy's just had fire spit at him. He's pretty upset, so that's what's on his focus, and he's going to focus that rage on the person who spat it at him, and that's going to be fair farm. Okay, this goblin is done. So as the DM, I then click on Next Actor, and you'll see that uh, when we did that, Grow um, had a little bit of a chime kickoff. So Grow is now the character who's got to go here. Uh, now, one of the things that a DM should be aware, aware of, as well as players, is that party members can move through other party members as long as you don't end up stopping on the same square. And what that means is that I can do that. So I can, as a player, I can literally go right over the top of where... Uh, uh, Duldor is actually standing. Okay? And that's because I'm passing through that particular square. There is a difference, though, when it comes to enemy movements. So I'm going to move, so that's 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. So, Gro has managed to get into a uh, range that is uh, distance. He really isn't going to have anything except entangle. So he's going to target both of these. Interesting that that's saying 15 feet. So for some reason it thinks that distance is 10 to there. But this is 15. So in some cases it is registering the squares as being 5 feet. Weird. All right. That's actually 10 feet of distance because there's 5 foot to here and then 5 foot into whatever... Um, you're attacking here because you're technically at the center of each of these boxes. 
and he's going to cast Entangle. And for that, I just clicked once. All right, uh, they both failed. So with that in mind, they are now both restrained. And if you look here, and I'm going to zoom in on the, uh, the goblins, you'll see that there's now a restrained effect that is on both of these particular goblins. That means that they can't really move. They can still fight, but they can't really move. So they're now pinned in that particular location. Now, Grow um, doesn't have any movement left, I don't think. So he can 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. No, so he has no additional movements. Uh, as a bonus action, he has nothing he can really do except for maybe this, the Shele. It's really a wooden club. And that would Im imbue his uh, quarterstaff with this ability. He's going to hold off on that. He doesn't feel these goblins are going to survive overly long. And he also has a resistance spell that he's not going to cast, but that is also an action, so he can't cast that. So he is done. Now, what I was going to tell you about uh, the goblins, and I'm going to use the uh, player screen for this, just because it's uh, going to be a little bit clearer. If this goblin in the previous turn, so I'm just going to temporarily move Grow out of the way, and I'm going to select uh, Fairfarn so that we can see the visibility of these goblins. If this goblin had decided to move... Oops. Aha! <laughs> player can't move that. So, again, left mouse click moves the whole map, not just the picture in the map. <laughs> If this goblin had gone and decided to try to run away, he could move, well, not necessarily to this square, but he could, or these two squares, but he could potentially move all the way around this particular player and not leave that player's sphere of influence, although he wouldn't be able to take in up this square, this square, this square, or this square. A DM could be talked into allowing um, an NPC to take up this square or a player to take up this square, but in any event, if he had gone into any of these particular uh, squares in, during his movement turn, that goblin would not have triggered an attack of opportunity or reaction from Fairfarn. However, if that goblin had gone into one of these two squares or had moved over to this square after leaving this particular or this particular square, that would have provided Fairfarn an attack of opportunity or what's called a reaction. Um... You only get one of those per turn. So let's say this goblin had moved to here. Oh, let's put him there. Farron Fern had used his um, attack of opportunity to attack that particular creature or goblin. And then this goblin on its movement turn did this. This goblin can leave Farron Fern's sphere of influence with no risk whatsoever. Okay. Because Farron had already used up his reaction. It would not trigger a second attack of opportunity. Another thing here. If Farron had simply um, set up a... I will attack these creatures under a specific condition. Even if he had been standing here. Then what would have actually happened. If none of those triggers occurred. And then Fer this goblin had moved out of the way. Farron decided to use that as an attack of opportunity, then all of a sudden his trigger trigger um, statement came into play, he would not be able to use it. Because when you use the ready action to set up your move or to set up a condition at which point you are going to react, and that word there is key, you are actually setting up a reaction. You are not setting up a dedicated action. Okay? Um, so players and DMs should be aware of that. And it is clearly worded in the D, uh, the player's handbook. So I'm going to show that on the player, sc player screen. All right. So uh, under reference manual, if you search for ready, after expanding out the window, go to actions in combat and scroll down. If you look at the ready action, the first paragraph clearly states... Sometimes you want to get the jump on a foe or wait for a particular circumstance before you act. To do so, you can take the ready action on your turn so that you can act later in the round using your reaction. 
all right? So I want that to be clear. You only get one reaction. And when you set up a, um, a, a ready action, that is exactly what you're doing, is you're setting up your reaction. Now, some DMs won't allow you to use an attack of opportunity if you've set a ready statement or a ready action. I've seen that happen. And the logic makes sense in some ways, in the sense that you as the DM or you as the player have set up a series of conditions that you are waiting to happen before you react to something. If something completely unrelated happens and one of your statements is that that goblin didn't move or it wasn't that it moved out of my sphere of influence, theoretically, you should not be able to react to that condition using your reaction. So there's a 50-50 split on that particular um, way that a DM is going to call that. I myself have played it both ways, but I'm now leaning more towards the fact that you're staging your reaction. Therefore, if a creature moves out of your sphere of influence... And you have stated a ready action. Your reaction is not going to trigger on that unless that statement included or unless a creature moves out of my sphere of influence. In that opinion, or my opinion rather, that means that if Farron Fern had set up a specific condition and this goblin moved out of his sphere of influence and that condition didn't include that a particular goblin or goblins, moved out of his sphere of influence. He won't get a reaction. That's the way that I read that. I don't know if it's accurate, but that's the way I'm now leaning more towards playing it. Because you're technically preparing your reaction for a specific condition. Therefore, you're not really ready to take advantage of an attack of opportunity because you've already prepped your reaction. Let me know in the comments how you all feel about that. Um, I'm, it, it's an interesting discussion point that I'd like to... to get different points of view on. Okay, so Gro has now used his movement. He has now used his action. He doesn't really have a bonus action that he can make use of, and he has no reaction set up or whatnot right now. But theoretically, if one of these two goblins did decide to move past Gro and moved up to this particular square here, Gro could very easily take an attack of opportunity on that because he still has a reaction left. All right, but Gro has nothing else to do, so he's going to move into this. Now, the Fisher, not coming into play yet. This goblin, however, is definitely in play, so he's going to target and attack Farron Farron. And again, I've got Farron Farron set up as the target. This particular character is restrained, and as long as Gro maintains concentration then this will last for 10 rounds. I do believe that is what the D stands for. Duration, yeah, 10 rounds. Um, all right, so he's going to attack Farron Farron. Oops. Oh, right. Disadvantage roll. So, um... Doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay, so we dropped the 18. He rolled a 20. Uh, roll to 20 plus 4. So he hits on a 14. So an attack of upper, uh, or sorry, an attack with disadvantage is going to roll two dice. It will drop the highest roll. So in this case, that particular goblin rolled a 10. Added 4, because that's his bonus, an attack plus 4. That equaled 14 as the AC. Now if you look at Farnfarn's AC, you'll see on the player side, that it is actually 11. So that means that the goblin has now hit. So to actually have that goblin apply their damage, you literally just double click on that. Now Farron Farron has taken damage, and you can see that on the player side of the combat tracker, he has taken or suffered moderate damage. On the DM's side of the combat tracker, you'll see exactly how many wounds he has suffered, what his total hit points are, um, sorry, what his, yeah, what his total hit points are, and that means that he now has, uh, eight, my math is bad, seven hit points left. All right. And that's the same with this particular goblin. Now, theoretically, I could make both of these goblins visible on the combat tracker because they are, in fact, visible. 
to grow and to um, Fern Fern. It's now conceivable that Gro and Fernfern have indicated to Duldor and Clever that they've got two goblins pinned down here. So it makes sense to make these particular characters visible, or NPCs visible. And if you look, you'll see that the player can see that they're in critical condition. They're badly hurt. All right, so that is that goblin's turn, and now Clever gets to go. So Clever... Oh, and in case you are wondering what I'm doing here... Even though, if you look on the DM screen, Clever has a white circle that is around uh, her particular pog, or in the case of D uh, Duldor, it would be his token. Um, it means that that character is the one that is active, and all players will be able to see that. But on the player screen, you actually have to left-click on the particular character. Now, I've just deselected Clever, so it's a toggle. And what this means is that Right now, nobody is selected. Clever is now selected, so her visibility is restricted to what this particular token in Pog, or Pog, can actually see. Now she's going to move. That's 10, 20. Mm, can't move there. So you can't move to that particular square. She is going to move there. She is now exposed both of these particular characters. And I could not move to this square because it would mean that she was using up a square that someone else is already using. And I could not move to this particular square because if you look on the DM screen, that is terrain you can't pass through in this particular case. She didn't have enough movement left to be able to get through that. In addition, from here to here, even though technically you could theoretically pass there and there's only half of it taking up that particular square, I am of the opinion that if there's any difficult terrain that is taking up this particular square or a given square, a player really can't move into it without suffering a difficult terrain penalty. And that means that moving at half speed. All right, so she has moved to here, and she is going to make a ranged attack against this particular goblin here. So I'm, once again, I have held down the control key and left clicked on that particular goblin's icon. And you'll see in the uh, combat tracker that she does indeed have it targeted. I'm going to load up Clever's action page. And I'm going to shoot an arrow. Now, I've intentionally left these as not collected. I want you to see how many pips, like the, the, at the pips as they get used up. She might burn through the rest of these arrows in this particular map. Okay, so she's going to make an attack roll. Oops, she has an advantage roll on that. And on the DM side and on the player side, you'll see that the green uh, coloring of the dice implies that the higher number was chosen in this particular case. The previous roll that was made by the goblin, on the, if you look on the DM side, it was a red die. That means that the lowest of the two die uh, had been taken. So that's an easy way to distinguish between a disadvantage roll and an advantage roll. And I waited to get one of each before I explained that. So she hit with a 22. She is definitely hit with that. Now, Clever doesn't see that she is actually hit with that particular um, attack, whereas the DM has. So the DM is going to say, that is a hit. That's when she can roll. Uh, and in this case, she's going to roll her damage die. She's rolled a one point, but she does five points of additional damage. And that goblin is now dying. So it is now unconscious, but there's, other than an icon that appears in the bottom corner where it's unconscious, there's no other indication to the player that that particular um, NPC is now down. So it's on the, pl the onus is on the player to confirm who's actually still up. So this goblin here is still up. This goblin here is not. And that comes into play for the next attack, and that's going to be Doldor. All right, so Wolf 2 doesn't really come into play yet. Wolf 3, or Wolf 8, rather, doesn't really come into play yet. Now, it is Duldor. So I've selected Duldor. 10, 20. Now, theoretically, he can move there. But I'm going to have him move here. And does Duldor even have the ability to attack at range? Yes, he has a crossbow, but he does have 20 bolts. I forgot to set that up. All right, so 
I'm also going to use a ranged attack on this particular goblin. And again, you can see that I've just control left clicked on that particular goblin, and Dualdor now has that particular creature targeted. I'm going to make my attack roll, and there's an advantage roll in play here. That is a hit, and this is going to roll a 1d8, and that is definitely going to take out that other goblin. And you can see this one is flat out dead. Um, again, these particular in um, status indicators are specific to players, is the way that I understand it, because a, uh, an NPC is killed when they're in a dying state. Um, they are not necessarily supposed to go into a dying state. They're the minute they hit their hit zero hit points left, they're supposed to actually be dead. Um, I don't know why Fantasy Grounds isn't able to distinguish that. It's able to distinguish different icon types and, and whatnot, so maybe it's something that they can work on. But at this point, we are done with this particular um, combat scenario. Now, Farron Farron has taken some damage. Technically, there is no one left, according to the DM screen, to take on any additional movement. And when I actually go through and trigger this, it should have triggered a roll on the initiative. In this case, it has not. And the reason for that is because I don't have that turned on. But what I can do now is remove the two goblins from the combat tracker. They're going to disappear from the player side. And the party can now go through the process of searching those particular goblins for any kind of loot. Um, now, I am doing an experience point, uh, experience point based reward system. So these would be the two goblins. So I'm going to drag that into there. I'm going to award these for now. Oops, sorry, I manually selected those. So I'm going to award these, and you'll see that the party got 88 experience points each. That's a little bit short from the 300 that the whole party is going to need in order to uh, uh, level up. But they're not done yet. Technically, they also should have received a, uh, a reward for avoiding the two traps. Um, so where was that? Goblin Trail, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, story reward. So they have found... Um, Kragma Hideout, which means they should have received this story award. So I'm going to award that. That's 163, so that puts them at halfway there. Um, and then there's the encounter for the trail traps. You'll note that they don't really get any experience points here. Um, but when the party arrives at the hideout, award, uh, award uh, each uh, character 75 experience points. Um, that was already done. I do believe, yes, that was already done. So that's taken care of for this. So as you can see, in a lot of ways, there's a lot of automation that takes place as the DM, and you don't have to worry about it. And you just literally focus on the uh, on the story. All right. So I'm going to close that. And I'm going to close that. So that shows you an example on how the line of sight functionality works. If you wish me to continue this particular uh, uh, campaign, please let me know in the comments. I'll go through and I can finish off the rest of this particular map in the next um, next video. Again, I want to try to keep these videos a little bit shorter so that people don't uh, have to sit there and listen to me for that long. Um, and what that will allow uh, me to do is to indicate that, yes, people are enjoying these particular videos. So please let me know if you want me to continue. Um, this will be the end of episode three of the campaign for the, the Lost Minds of Fendelver. I don't really want to run through the whole campaign module because that would spoil it for somebody else. And there is uh, a couple of other videos out there for it from other, uh, other people on YouTube. Um, but if you do wish me to continue this, go ahead and let me know. I am, however, going to focus on a more specific set of tutorials. Some of them have already been released as of last Thursday. And I'm in the process of recording the next series of videos for that simultaneously in, in relation to when I'm recording these. Um, so this video will pop out Monday. 
and hopefully I will have another set of the the topics specific tutorials uh, ready to go for the upcoming Thursday um, and if I get enough positive responses in the sense of continuing on with this particular campaign because really this particular session was to highlight how the actual uh, uh, line of sight functionality was going to work um, then let me know and I'll go ahead next weekend and record another campaign tutorial and, and see if I can't get a little bit further through this particular module. I might play ahead a little bit and then continue on with an area that has a, a little bit more of a different um, different aspect to it. Or I might continue on with this and show you how some of the other aspects of the, the map actually work. Now this area doesn't really have any secret locations per se. Um, sorry for the players to spoil that, <laughs> but there are areas that are considered shortcuts, and uh, if people want to see those, then uh, let me know, and I will go ahead and record those. Okay, so this will be the end of episode three in the campaign uh, tutorial series.